Hi, before we start, I'd like to check my email messages. Good afternoon. You have two new messages. First message from University Video Communications. Date, Friday, April 21st, 1995. Subject, Educational Video. Hi, Bathsheba. Please be ready to start taping at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Second message from Christine Hansen. Date, Friday, April 21st, 1995. Subject, Facts from Mr. Fujisaki. Start of message. Dear Bathsheba, good news from Japan. The contract is signed. See you later. Chris. Great. Well, luckily I don't have 300 email messages, so I can start now. I'd like to talk to you about True Voice version 5, which is the latest and greatest version of text-to-speech. Uh, here at Centigram, uh, our product, all our text-to-speech software products are called True Voice. And let's start with a definition of what text-to-speech is. A lot of people think that text-to-speech is talking dolls, and it certainly is not. Um, talk to you about some commercial synthesis strategies for producing text from speech. Then go to levels of application complexity. Certain applications that use text-to-speech technology are much more difficult for the technology as it stands today than others. Of course, the most difficult one is the reading of email. Email tends to be the sloppiest and least grammatical of all the texts we've seen, and it presents really special challenges for text-to-speech technology. And then I'm going to tell you about some apl application-specific improvements that we've made to the technology specifically to deal with some irregular text like email or fax. And then, after a demo, we'll move to some future directions of what we believe are important improvements to make to the technology to make it more useful for all of you. So let's start with the definition. What is text-to-speech? Well, text-to-speech is the automatic conversion of printed text to spoken words. That means that you can type in anything you want. You can type in a word. You can type in a sentence. You can type in a recipe. You can type in a short message. But you can also type in War and Peace or any Russian novel that you please, and it will read it to you. And every word is pronounced. Now, there are two commercial strategies for making your computer talk. The first one is called Formant Synthesis by Rule. And that was developed at MIT in the early 70s. And it is a computer model of the vocal tract that generates speech. Now, the vocal tract is everything between your lips and your larynx at a right angle. And what we have is a model of that vocal tract that produces the synthesized speech. The other commercial method for producing text from speech is called concatenation. Concatenation is a much more intuitive way of making your computer talk. For instance, say I want the speech to sound just like me. What I would do is I would record myself saying hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of syllables. I'd go into a recording studio or I'd get a voice much better than mine, and I, I'd hire that person to go to a recording studio and record thousands of syllables like ba, bu, da, du, ga, gu. And I'd pay a professional speaker $300 an hour or more to record that over, oh, sometimes three or four years and build up an inventory of those syllables or half syllables or syllables and a half. And then what I would do is I would put those pieces of sil those syllables together. So if I had a word like absolutely, I take the ab and the sul and the lute and the lee, and I'd have absolutely. Now, anyone who's worked in form and synthesis by rule wishes that they'd worked in concatenation because a lot of times we want a voice to sound exactly like a particular person. But of course, the people who work in concatenation have their own problems, and they say, gee, I'd like to be able to, to have a computer model of a vocal tract so I could just change things in a line of code. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages of either of these methods. First, let's talk about concatenation. You don't have to worry about text-to-speech sounding natural if you have concatenation, because the ba and the boo and the da and the do were already recorded by a natural speaker, a human speaker and you have the luxury of being able to record anyone you want. So it's relatively easy to develop. Now the disadvantage is, if you want to make the speech sound better and better and better, 
you have to record more and more and more syllables. And sometimes it gets all the way up to 8 megabytes or 10 megabytes. Now also, when you're putting the syllables together in a concatenation model, so go back to the word absolutely, you have the ab, the sol, the lute, and the li, and it's kind of like splicing pieces of tape together. So sometimes you actually have a little pop between them. So you have ab, the, lute, li. Now sometimes the syllables go together rather smoothly, but sometimes they don't. Now also, because you have recorded a speaker in a studio, it is sometimes difficult to modify the intonation so that if you want to have a sentence that says, you said what? You would have to record another what. You couldn't just take the what that the speaker had recorded initially and make it say what or what. You can't do any of that. You'd have to get another syllable. So you are, in fact, tied to that model speaker and also to the way the model speaker recorded the speech initially. Now, with synthesis by you can also have natural sounding segments, but you have an advantage in that you can easily modify the rate, the pitch, or the volume just by changing a line of C code. Also, you have a low memory requirement because you didn't record all those bas and boos and dos and doos. Now, the disadvantage is that it's not that easy to develop. You must know a lot about the speech code, and you must have a background in acoustic phonetics. Also, it's difficult to model one particular speaker. Uh, in concatenation, you can uh, model the speaker of your choice, but in uh, a form and synthesis by rule model, um, you're really working on a computer-generated voice. Now, what we've done at Centigram is we've patented a method for combining the two. Um, and what we have is a hybrid concatenation and synthesis by rule strategy where we're able to produce the natural sounding segments and those segments actually have some personality and some dialect information. It's highly flexible. We don't have 8 megabytes. As a matter of fact, we have less than a me megabyte. And we believe that we have an easily identifiable speaker. We have, in fact, recorded a particular radio announcer who's very famous in the Bay Area, who is our model speaker. And we have him go to the studio and say, ba boo, da do, ga goo. But we don't store the syllables. What we do is we do a spectral analysis of all of his syllables, and we try to copy them in, co in code. Now, it would be like having a blank canvas next to a famous painting, and you're given a few colors to copy that picture. And what you do is you try to match it um, piece by piece, and that's what we do at Centigram with our True Voice method. We try to copy the way that our model speaker says things like, hey, dude, so we can copy the ew of dude. So we believe we have the best of both worlds. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about text-to-speech applications and why they're very different, and the technology has to be different to cope with them. Now, there are two kinds of basic texts that can be created in a text-to-speech application. The first one is done by an application developer. So you're a big company, and you buy text-to-speech, and you decide you want to have a little script so that when people call in over the phone, they get a, something read to them in text-to-speech. Now, typically, uh, an application developer will hire somebody to create that script, and that person will listen to the speech over and over and over again to make sure that it sounds good and put in commas and put in periods and make sure everything is spelled correctly and make sure everything is properly formatted. And then someone will call in and get the message in text-to-speech. However, lately there's been a lot of interest in using text-to-speech for end-user applications. And in that case, you don't have any control whatsoever of the text or of the script. So, of course, in things like faxes or email, anything can be written. Things can be misspelled, and basically, um, you're dealing with uh, a, a random sample of text. Now, for let's let's take a, a typical application um, that would be uh, name confirmation. Now, name confirmation uses text to speech, and say a voicemail system where you call up someone and it says, "Bacheva Malchine." is not available right now. Now, the is not available right now is going to be in human voice, and the only part that's going to be in text-to-speech
will be, but she have a machine. Because maybe you're in a company with 20,000 employees, and they decided not to store everyone's name in, in real human voice. So they've used text-to-speech for that. So it's a limited use of the technology there. Let's talk about levels of text-to-speech application complexity. Certainly, certain applications present more difficulty for text-to-speech than others. And it really depends on the text that's being read. Now, there are certain applications that always have predictable words and also are highly grammatical and highly structured and less complex than others. Let's take, for example, name confirmation, where all you're saying is someone's name, and it's always in the same place. So it's always, Bacheva Malsheen is not available right now, or Chris Hansen is not available right now. That certainly is not a very complicated application for text-to-speech. And even the interactive voice response applications like order statics, job postings, university registration, um, when you get information in text-to-speech, for those applications, certainly those are not particularly difficult for text-to-speech because they're usually two or three lines long and they're also predictable vocabularies. Then you get to document reading, which gets a little more complex, a word process document, and then faxes, and then finally email. By the time you get to faxes and email, people take a lot of liberties with the kind of grammar they use. They tend to be loosely structured texts and also a lot more complex in the sentence structure. Now, let's take a classic interactive voice response application where someone else, where someone is actually sitting down and editing text. Well, you're in the position of evaluating text-to-speech for a company, and you'd like to choose a particular text-to-speech vendor. So what you usually do is you ask for the demo line. You say, gee, I'd, I'm interested in your text-to-speech, and I'd like to listen to it. Can I have the tele-demo line? Now, what you're hearing is a very well-crafted text message. Now, someone has sat down before you got a chance to listen to that text message and has made sure that there are absolutely no misspellings. The formatting is perfect for the text-to-speech engine. There's lots of punctuation, lots of commas and periods for pauses. All capital letters are always used exactly where they're supposed to be used. There are no really, there are no freaky fonts there, no, bla no blank lines, no smiley faces. And all the difficult words that weren't spelled correctly, somebody figured out how to spell in some, some interesting way to make it sound good. Then that text goes through the text-to-speech converter or engine, and what comes out is usually optimal text-to-speech output, the best that that engine can possibly produce. Intelligent, natural-sounding speech, and certainly no mispronunciations, because the person who edited the text already figured out that it's not going to have any. Now, let's, let's look at something like name confirmation. Here's a typical script for name confirmation. Now, all of these lines are done in human voice. Hello, welcome to the Boyer Insurance Company information line. Please enter your personal information number. Thank you. Please enter the party's name via your touchtone phone. You enter it. Now, the only thing that's said in text-to-speech is Chris Hansen. Chris Hansen is insured for $10,000 of medical care. This is a limited use of the technology. The only reason you're using text-to-speech here is because perhaps there's a subscriber list of several thousand and you don't, and also that subscriber list changes very rapidly, sometimes every day. So you want to make sure that that little piece is said in text-to-speech and the rest of it is in, in human voice. So again, that's a limited use of the technology. Now, another typical text-to-speech application, which is also an interactive voice response application, is customer name and address reading. And it's also called reverse directory. I can type in a number on my touch-tone phone, and the text-to-speech can answer the phone and say, hello, that number belongs to Bacheva Malsheen. Malsheen, M-A-L-S-H-E-E-N. The address is 488 University Ave, Palo Alto, California, 94301. Now, the person who sets up the reverse directory applications has to use a control sequence, like the one you see at the top of the page, for semicolon 1D, so that abbreviations are turned on, so we know that AVE is Avenue and not AVE, and that CA is California. Now, also, we have to make sure that the phone number is read as a phone number or the zip code is read as a zip code, 94103, and not 94103. 
So there's a lot of human editing that has to go on before you recognize the name and address that you were looking for. Now, in the new market for text-to-speech, which is the unified messaging market, which combines email, fax mail, and voicemail, a lot of times you're dealing with a script that the user constructed. And I hate to insult end users, but they very often have what's called poorly crafted text input, a lot of random formatting, inappropriate or no punctuation. Some people have email messages five paragraphs long with no punctuation whatsoever inappropriate case. Some people use all capital letters, some people use all small letters. Lots of different fonts and a lot of difficult words, unusual surnames, abbreviations that you will never find in a dictionary, lots of smiley faces, and an overuse of punctuation such as six exclamation points. And incidentally, that is the average number of exclamation points in an e email message. And they're all back to back. Now, if the same text-to-speech engine receives poorly crafted text input, what you will get from that same text-to-speech engine is unnatural, incomprehensible speech. So what happened was you evaluated the text-to-speech algorithm based on the teledemo, which was carefully crafted. And you took home the text-to-speech converter, and you found out that you didn't get what you thought you bought. Now, what we've done. For our project at Cenogram is we've tried to make text-to-speech usable in the unified messaging market by giving people remote access to email that they can understand. So let's look at a typical message created by an end user. You notice that at the beginning, of course, there's no capital letter on the sorry. And G, if you look at the second line, the doctor's appointment, it's not a capital D. So you have that problem. And of course, no one has used regular sentence structure with periods. You have two or three periods after code. And then, of course, you have a small letter in he. And then three periods again after et cetera. And then that little thing that shows up only in email, asterisks around extremely. So because you wanted to say, it's extremely important that we help him as much as possible. And then you have uh, your typical ac acronym, because GAL wants this up and running now. Now, now is in all capital letters, but you don't want it pronounced N-O-W. You want it to say now. Now, in the 1030 AM, you not only have small letters for AM, but there's no space between the 3-O and the AM. And then boil dry facility, again, small d, small r. Now, text-to-speech has never been good enough to deal with all this variation. And if you play this text through a typical text-to-speech converter, even the best engine on the market, it's not equipped to deal with these problems. It is simply not equipped to deal with a message created by an end user. It needs an application developer to edit it and, and make it perfect for the text-to-speech. Now, let's take a look at some internet headers. Now, I know that you've all seen headers like this. And you certainly do not want this read to you over the phone when you're in an airport trying to check your email messages. You want it condensed in some way. Now what we do is we filter this email header and we just give you start of message from Daniel, date, Friday, October 14th at 1750 Pacific Daylight Time, subject, email reader demo. We also find an embedded forwarded message and we will say forwarded message date Tuesday July 31st 1990 at 721 Pacific Daylight Time from Melvin May subject equipment damage report so you can get just that information over the phone if you're trying to check your messages remember there are a lot of different date and time formats in email messages and what we do is we read all of them correctly we've co we've collected over 10,000 email messages and we've looked at all possible, uh, certainly the ones we've seen um, are, are pretty complicated. We've looked at all the possible types of formats and we deal with them. Now, let's look at an email message before pre-processing. Again, notice that in the first line, I visited CECOM. It's not pronounced C-E-C-O-M, but half of it is pronounced C, and the other COM, and also, what we've done is we have embedded a forwarded message inside 
the message. You remember those greater than signs that are in all of uh, the forwarded email messages. Well, you certainly don't want it to say greater than. And let's look at as described on PP230-235. Well, there's no period after the PP. And in that dash between 230 and 235, how do you know whether it's a dash or it's supposed to be 2, T-O, 230 to 235? Well, then towards the end of the sentence, you have a fraction, 1 half. When is it 1 half and when is it 1 slash 2? On their 16-foot sloop, well, when is it foot, when is it feet, and when is it four? To buy 12 dozen apples, 102-inch nails, and three heaping gallons of ice cream from the gal at the 50,000-square-foot store. Gee, I have to know when to say square foot, when to say square feet. I have to know the difference between gallon gallons. And gee, look at the, on the uh, next to the last line there, you have a quote, quotation mark. And I have to look at that very carefully to know that it is 3 minutes 27 seconds to watch the star at 70 degrees 30 minutes 12 seconds, a temperature 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit at the surface. Quotation marks present a particular problem because they can be quotation marks, they can be inches, or they can be seconds. Also, Fahrenheit is something that you would need to understand that something was degrees before it, otherwise capital F could be someone's first initial. So that was the end of the forwarding message. And you'll notice below that that you have not again surrounded by asterisks. And then you have another email specific convention, underlines be before and after crazy. And as we all know, in email that means that you're supposed to stress the word. So this was supposed to be pronounced as this is definitely not in agreement with our original plan. This is completely crazy. Just because Paul doesn't know what I'm doing? Five question marks. Now, when we get to exclamation, I will tell you, uh, as I did before, that six exclamation points is the norm. People are particularly passionate in email. And all of those engineers that use email uh, seem to want to get very excited or for the speech to get very excited in their messages. And so we have provided that for them in a voice. Now, let's look at what our intelligent preprocessor did. You'll notice that everything has been disambiguated. We know when to say Fahrenheit, we know when to say gal, we know when to say gallons, we know when to say feet and foot. And in the bottom of the end of the forwarded message, you'll notice that uh, we have italicized the not and the crazy because we even take care of that. So, what Centigram has is an additional element of intelligence to their text-to-speech. We do correction for the end user, and we allow the end user to input text as they please. The text goes through our intelligent preprocessor, dresses it up, it goes through the text-to-speech engine, and you get the same speech output quality that you would if the text had been edited and re-edited. Now, let's look at a real killer piece of input. Now, this might be exaggerated, and maybe your email messages don't look like this, but we have seen all of these types of things in email messages. We ha have, he is buried six feet under Fort Myers, Florida, in a plot eight feet long. You can see all the ambiguities there. Six feet under Fort Myers. Now, Florida, small fl, could be fluid, and certainly eight feet could be, that could be a quote mark. Again, we have 80 degrees, 11 minutes, 32 seconds west long. And look at Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, Hilo, Hawaii. We have to know the difference of what is Hawaii and what is uh, high, just plain high. You'll notice also at the end, we have to know the difference between California and Circa. These are all done through a very, very large set of context sensitive rules. So please look at the output and see how we have disambiguated all of this. Why is this important? Because when you're checking your email over the phone and two or three words are mispronounced in a sentence, you have lost it. And what you will probably do is hang up, just as you would if a human speaker was mispronouncing 
three words per sentence. So that's why it's important. Now, these are the features of our intelligent text-to-speech. Firstly, we read headers, email, or fax. And we strip out all the unwanted header information, so all of that gobbledygook in the internet messages will be gone, and all you'll have is start of message, date, time. We read names, titles, phone numbers, and addresses appropriately, and you don't have to input any control sequence. We also interpret all the multiple date and time formats correctly, so that if the date is 1994-29, you'll know that it's a, a year, a month, and a day. Let's talk about phone numbers. I said that before, gee, we read phone numbers correctly. Why is that difficult? Well, in our collection of email messages, we found all these different types of phone numbers. Sometimes people put a dash between the first three digits and the last four. Sometimes they don't. Now, you can pronounce the third one on the left, 123-4500, um, Down uh, towards the bottom, we have area codes. So you'd like it to say area code 405, 103, 4567. Um, you notice that uh, sometimes there's a space between the right parentheses, uh, and sometimes there's not. 415-123-4560, sometimes there's just uh, dashes, um, sometimes there's no dashes. Um, with extensions, you want it to say extension 987 and not 987, or extension 9876, not 9876. And actually, there are even more types. And in the past, text-to-speech has been very sensitive to spacing and to dashes and to parentheses, so that if even one space was different, from what the code expected, you wouldn't get a phone number correctly. And you know that most of the time when you're checking your email, you're looking for information like addresses and phone numbers. Some other features that we have. As we showed you before, we can expand abbreviations, and not just the abbreviations you find in the dictionary, but abbreviations that are specific to faxes or email, and even the ones that are three ways ambiguous, like FL, which can be fluid or Florida. Now, we also have, we expand some very uh, uncommon abbreviations, or abbreviations that you know and you've seen all of your life, but you'll never find in a dictionary, like with and without, and BTW, and received, and MNFG, and NFW, that show up a lot in, uh, in email messages. We also provide emphasis to underlining asterisks italics, so that if you meant to be angry in an email message, the email message will come out angry. If you meant to be excited in an email message, it will come out with all the passion that you had intended. Also, punctuation. If you put it in, well, we will pronounce it the way you intended. And uh, if you over-punctuate, uh, we will uh, provide the correct uh, intonation. And for the multifunction punctuation, like inches, quote, and seconds, we can disambiguate it. Also, if you should want to listen to differential equations over the phone, we can pronounce those we ad correctly. We identify them as mathematical expressions, and we will say mx plus b, or 3a to the 1 plus n power. So why don't we go over here, and instead of me talking, let's let the computer talk, and I'm going to play you something from our intelligent preprocessor. Let's take a look at a text message that includes a lot of city and state abbreviations that are non-standard. Some of them include commas, some of them don't. Some of them include periods, some of them don't. And there's a really wide variety of abbreviations here. Let's look at what our intelligent preprocessor does to this. And we'll hear it speak at the same time that we see it pre-processed in real time. Is it Springfield, Massachusetts, or Springfield, Illinois? Or Missoula, Montana, or Jackson, Mississippi? How about Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and Baton Rouge, Louisiana? And Colorado Springs, Colorado, and Colorado Springs, Colorado? He worked at the Bank of California in San Francisco, California. He went to the University of Connecticut on Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Stanford, Connecticut. He lived at 123 Columbus Circle, apartment 5C, near Canyon Point, not far from the Port of New York. 
Third Avenue is near Fourth Avenue. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. He lived on Yale Court or Yale Court or Yale Court in Bridgeport, Connecticut. It was apt that she was in apartment D. Okay. Now let's look at a real email message, the kind we all know and love, the kind that have those big internet headers. So I'm going to open one up right now. You can see the header. And what we're going to do is we're going to put this message through our intelligent preprocessor that is going to do header stripping and come out with something that says start of message. It's going to mention the subject. It's going to read the date correctly, Friday, 20th of October, 1989, instead of Fry 20 OCT. And then it's going to read the body of the message. Start of message. Date, Friday, October 20th, 1989 at 7.10 Pacific Daylight Time. From Barbara Kampf. Subject, document for D-close. Thanks, Keith. I looked at your draft. Nice job. How about at the very end adding words like, however, if any of the configurations above are needed by you, please let us know and we will prepare a formal proposal and modification to our current task. How are you doing on reviewing the schedule and deliverables? Thanks. B. You notice that in this email message, the text-to-speech pronounced the exclamation correctly. Thanks, Keith. I looked at the draft. Nice job. Also, it ignored the banner right here uh, and didn't say dash, 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 dash. Now let's talk about some current development projects that we're doing at Cenogram right now to improve the text-to-speech even more and make it useful for you in your applications. First of all, we're developing a whole new group of male and female voices. Uh, old voices and new voices, uh, old and young, and uh, sexy and unsexy. Uh, of course, we're always working on voice quality improvement uh, to make the speech as natural as possible. And we're also working on foreign email readers, uh, header stripping for German, French, Italian, Spanish, reading abbreviations in those languages as well. Finally, let's talk about future directions for text-to-speech. We believe that our text analysis project will go on for a long time as we collect more and more email messages and we find more and more abbreviations that we never thought about before. We also are going to provide more intonation types so that if you would like to convey sarcasm or happiness or kindness or irony, our text-to-speech will now pronounce it that way.